Awesome. And I'm going to share my screen once again. Okay. Well, thank you all uh, for coming uh, and being here and uh, trying out this great new experiment that we're all uh, uh, in on together. Um, I've never taught a full class online before, so it's the first one for me. Um, I did teach, of course, a little bit of last semester towards the end online, and um, I think we've gotten things uh, much better since then. So hopefully this will be uh, a good experience for all of us. I know I'm looking forward to it, and um, I'm looking forward to having all of you in my class. So this is a particularly large class. Um, you can see already there's about 136 participants in here. So um, I would like it if you all just kept yourself muted until you had a question. I will uh, monitor questions and um, then I will unmute you and, uh, and you can ask your question, okay? So that's the way we're gonna try it. If for some reason I'm ignoring you and I, I'm completely clueless, go ahead and unmute yourself and yell at me and just tell me, hey, I've been raising my hand for 15 minutes and you're ignoring me. So that's perfectly acceptable, okay? But generally speaking, uh, we'll try to work that way and, uh, and see how it goes, all right? So, um, okay, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. What you should be able to uh, see my screen right now, here on the left, it says, welcome to general chemistry, and here are some comments I've written. Um, if you don't have enough space on your um, screen and you can't read my writing here, I'm gonna be writing at about this level. Can, can those of you that I can see, can you raise your hand if you can read that writing? Just raise your hand like this, I mean, actually physically. Does that look okay? Okay, all right, good. So I'm gonna assume that that level of writing is good and I'm gonna assume that you can read that. You can make a little more room on your screen if you click on the little display that shows pictures of, of me and the other people. Up over on the left, there's a thing called high thumbnail video. That should give you a little more real estate on your screen to be able to see the important stuff, which is gonna be this, these slides, and this writing. So the whole time during lecture, that's what I'll be displaying. I'll be showing you slides and I'll be writing on the document camera, okay? All right, so uh, again, welcome. My name is Dr. Navaldo Tro, and I'm gonna be your professor this semester. And uh, if you want and continue taking this class in the spring, uh, I'll be your professor again in the spring, and hopefully in the spring uh, we'll be live. That's what I'm hoping for anyway. Um, my, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my family is from Havana, Cuba. Uh, they immigrated to the United States, my mom and my dad and my two sisters uh, in 1959. Uh, my brother and I were the first two to be born here. Uh, so I come from an immigrant family. I speak fluent Spanish and I love all things of my culture. So that's why you were listening to a little salsa music uh, before class started. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, I, uh, before that, uh, my grandfather uh, is from northern Spain, a little mountain town called Soto de Agues in Asturias. I got the privilege to live a year in Spain with my family just a, about three years ago. And um, I have probably 80 aunts, uncles, and cousins uh, in Spain, as well as all the people, all my aunts and uncles and relatives from Cuba that are now pretty much all in the United States. Uh, I grew up in uh, Culver City, West Los Angeles. Some of you uh, that are from Los Angeles may have been to Culver City before. Uh, I went to Culver City High School and, um, and was born there, I grew up there, I left when I was 18. Uh, went to college here in Santa Barbara at Westmont College where I graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Then I moved up the coast to Stanford where I got my uh, PhD uh, in physical chemistry. And then from there, I went to UC Berkeley, where I did a postdoc uh, in physical chemistry as well. I've been teaching chemistry for uh, 30 years now, and um, I, still, I still love every minute of it. So it's very fun for me, and, um, and I'm glad uh, to be able to be doing it again this semester, even in a way I've never done it before. So I'm going to do my best and hope to give you a really good experience. And my goal, of course, is for you to learn chemistry. Right? So everything that I'm going to do this semester is with that goal in mind. I'm going to require a lot of you. So this isn't a class you can just kind of forget about. 
there's going to be lots of stuff to do all the time. All right. So it's going to require a lot of time and a lot of effort. But at the end of the day, my responsibility is to teach you this body of information and certain skills that you need um, to succeed in your chosen career and really to succeed in life. So that's my goal. All right. So I'd like to start just by going over the course mechanics a little bit. Uh, and again, this time is going to be a little different than normal. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, looking at, let's see if I can pull this up here. Bear with me for one second. Uh, I want to start by looking at the Canvas homepage. So um, right now you should be seeing the Canvas homepage on your screen. Right here it says Chem 155-40512 for all of you, but all of you are not in that CRN, okay? So don't let that confuse you. Uh, the CRN you are in is the CRN that's in your class schedule, all right? But they all say 40512 simply because I've combined them all into one section for the sake of uh, Canvas, all right? Um, here's my name, my email. If you email me, I will respond uh, within 24 hours, especially on weekdays, usually much sooner than that. I will try to be very attentive to email. Hopefully, I'll actually respond within a few hours rather than 24 hours, and, and maybe even sooner than that if I can, all right? But uh, that's the best way to reach me uh, is through email. My office hours are going to be Monday and Wednesday at 3.30 to 4.30, so immediately after class, I'll stay on the Zoom call, and you can stay and ask questions as much as you want. Uh, in addition, I'll have the office hours on Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 4. Those will be by appointment. If you'd like to see me during this time, just send me a quick email and let me know you're coming, and I'll, and I'll set you up. Uh, it's the, my, um, my Zoom will be the same for everything, classes, office hours. It's all the same link, and you can find it all on Canvas, so that should make it easy. And in fact, it's all right here. This is the lecture information. This is the link to all class Zoom lectures and office hours right here. Uh, you've made it today, so you've learned how to use that. The password is chemistry. All live lectures like this one will be Monday and Wednesday, 2 to 3.20. Many people have emailed me asking if they have to come to live lectures. The answer is no. It's not required. Why? Because all lectures will be recorded and will be posted right here immediately following the lecture, so by, or, or by 5 o'clock that day anyway. All right? And so if you can't come to a lecture, boom, you can listen to that lecture right here a little bit later in that same day, all right? So if you have any conflicts, it's not a problem, all right? Uh, the lab information um, you, is, is also right here on the home page in Canvas, all right? Um, this is, part of the lab is gonna be these Mc, Hayden McNeil lab simulations. So this is the, the link where you can um, purchase access to that. That'll be an additional purchase this semester, unfortunately, and I think the cost is $60. Um, the lab instructor will go over that on Wednesday during uh, the lecture, okay? The pre-lab lecture, which is Wednesday. The pre-lab lectures will be, you can access them here. They will be every Wednesday, all right, from five to six. Again, you don't have to attend. If you can't attend, the, the recordings will be posted here right afterwards, okay? So all of the class, you have the option of going to the live lectures or going to the recorded lectures. It won't matter. Uh, in terms of uh, any kind of credit you get for the class, okay? Uh, also on this home page in Canvas, you'll see all the lab section information. So these are the different lab instructors according to your CRN number, all right? Here's their contact information, so you can contact them directly, all right? Here are their, their Zoom links, right? So at the time when they are giving, when they are online, you can access them right here, all right? And here are links to their recorded Zoom sessions as well. So they will record their Zoom sessions as well, all right? So everything, again, is available synchronously or asynchronously. I also have a great lineup of tutors for you guys. So a lot of the time, um, we, you'll have um, questions. You know, you'll be working through problems and you can't figure it out or whatever. So notice that uh, the problem sets are always due Friday at midnight. All right, every week. Uh, these problem sets are pretty substantial. They will take you a couple, two to five hours or so of time. So you wanna make sure you start them early. And you can see here that starting Wednesday, and, and by the way, we're not gonna have this one on Tuesday tomorrow because um, it's still a little bit early and you haven't really started much. But certainly by Wednesday, uh, we'll have these help sessions. These help sessions are the TAs, they are 
fabulous. They took my class last semester. They all got top scores in the class, all right? So they'd be able to help you as you're sitting there working. So one thing, one way to do it is you can just sit there working on your problem set and have your Zoom open to whoever's online at that particular time. And you run into a question, boom, you ask them, okay? Or you can just go to them with your specific questions ready to go. Either way is fine, all right? But they're here to help you and notice how many hours you have available to you. I really encourage you to take advantage of this, right? It's a good way to get help throughout the semester. So here are the three tutors and here are their Zoom links. So during these hours, if you want help, you just click on their Zoom link and you will get them and they will be able to help you, okay? Uh, very good. Um, second thing here on, on the Canvas homepage is the syllabus. And you can see here that, um, uh, excuse me for one second, let me just make sure everything's going, okay. Um, you can see here uh, the textbook required, all right? So this is an online system, Mastering Chemistry. I see that a lot of you have already gotten access to it. I'll show you in a minute how you get access to it if you have it, okay? This is absolutely required. Virtually all the work that you're doing this semester or a great chunk of it is going to be through Mastering Chemistry. So if you don't have access to Mastering Chemistry, you really can't take this course. Uh, once you get access, you can upgrade to a paper version which they'll send you in the mail uh, if you'd like. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Megan, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanna clarify, um, I saw in the chat a little bit. So are we, we attend the Wednesday pre-lecture? Everybody not... will attend the Wednesday pre-lecture from five to six. If you can't okay. at that time, then it'll be recorded, it'll be online right after that. So you have the option of either the, the live or the recorded. Okay, and then straight away, um, you'd be jumping into lab. So there we are meeting for lab this week or no? No lab meeting this week, just the pre-lab lecture. Got it, thank you. Me labs will start next week. Okay. Hey, Niv 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 is yeah. the book for 156 the same as this book? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. Yep, same book, both semesters. Okay, so here's, of course, syllabus. Um, again, here's the book my information, my office hours, a little bit about course content. Dishonesty, wow, you know, all our tests are gonna be online. There's lots of opportunities to cheat. I hope you don't, and I ask you not to. And I will be um, allowing you to have a one-page information sheet. So you, during tests, you will have access to a one-page information sheet, but I just ask that that's all you use during the exams, okay? Um, the percentages of the grades are like this. So the lab is gonna be 15% of your grade. The four midterm exams are 30% of your grade. The final, which is cumulative over the semester, will be 10% of your grade. The problem sets, which you will be doing every Friday and turning in on mastering, are 15% of your grade. The pre and post class work, which are videos that you watch before and after class, much like the ones you watch before class today, uh, will be temp and you'll answer some questions on them starting on Wednesday will be 10% of your grade. And then the pretest will be 20% of your grade. The pretest will cover the kind of very similar material to that of what's on the test, right? But it won't be a time thing. You'll just go through and take it and you'll actually have several attempts to get the right answer. So it's kind of a way to prepare for the test, okay? Uh, what else? Um, this is the class schedule, right? And you can see that we're here in the first week. This tells you when all the exams are, all right? You'll have, probably have about a five hour window on that day to take the exam and there'll be, it'll be a one hour exam, all right? This is the material we're gonna be covering from the book. So um, you, you, it would be a good idea to read this this week. So this week you'd wanna be reading chapter one, next week chapter two and so on. This will give you an idea of what you should be reading in the book, all right? But all the material will be covered in lecture and the videos that you'll be seeing as well. So this is kind of um, a way to start learning the material and then it'll be reinforced with the videos uh, and the lecture, okay? Um, if you go down to here, you'll start to see, see some of the assignments that I do and I'll talk about those uh, in a second. All right, the next tab here, and actually let me do something here. Let me switch this to uh, student view so that I get the view that you have. All right, so this is actually the student view. 
So you'll see home syllabus and then my mastery and you click on that. And then you'll get this message, open my lab and mastering. If you're having any trouble with this technical problems, it's probably because you have your pop-ups blocked. So make sure you turn that off. I, I sent you a link in the, uh, I sent you a flyer uh, in the emails I've sent you to tell you exactly how to sign up for mastering. You got to check your system, system requirements, okay? Uh, in order to get this to work. So make sure you do that. Um, I'm gonna go all the way down to here. And I'm gonna accept all this. This is what, um, uh, why won't it do that for me? Okay, I think that worked. So this is how you'll get, you'll get to here and here's where you'll create your account. Okay, so you'll create a Pearson account. Then it'll come to the next screen where it'll tell you, you either have to pay for it or you have to get have an access code, all right? So if you buy it here, I think the access is $124 for the year, which would be the best way to go if you're gonna take both semesters of this class, or you can just buy a one semester access, okay? You can also get a 14 day free trial. Um, if you, maybe you don't know if you're gonna take this course for sure yet, or if the bookstore hasn't given you your access code yet, okay? So um, that's how you do that. I'm gonna go back and go into my, uh, my view so that you can see, um, Let's see. I'm going to leave student view. Sorry, this is a little slow. I'm going to open my lab and mastering. So once you get registered, this is where you're going to do your assignments. Okay. And uh, the easiest way to see your assignments is go to calendar view. And right here, so you can see what's due this week right here. Okay, so introduction to mastering chemistry. That is uh, for zero credit. It doesn't count for anything in terms of your grade, but I would like you all to do that so you understand how to use mastering. If you don't do this and you make mistakes with mastering, then you, you're gonna lose credit on your other assignments, right? So you gotta understand how to use mastering in order to do your assignments. So this is, this is totally on you to make sure you do this. And I would suggest doing it as soon as you can, right? Because then you can start working on the assignments. This is the first assignment that counts for credit. It's the pre-lecture assignment for Wednesday. So you're going to do this before you come to class on Wednesday. It's going to be due at 2 o'clock on Wednesday. There will always be one assignment due at 2 o'clock a day of every lecture, right? You can, um, you can either, uh, you can, um, no, sorry. So, so please go ahead and do that before you come to class or before you watch the recorded lecture. But either way, it has to be by 2 o'clock on Wednesday. And then every lecture will also have a post-lecture assignment due the following day, all right? So what you should do, again, if you come to class, of course, you can, you can do it right away. If you watch the lecture later recorded, then you have some time until the next day, for example, to do the post-lecture assignment. These two assignments are optional. They're math review. Excuse me for a minute. For those of you that um, feel like you need a little math review, a little rusty on your math skills, this will re review the math skills you need for this class, all right? So those are optional. Again, you can do them whenever you want. And then finally, the chapter one problem set. I'm gonna go ahead and link on, link on a couple of these so you see what happens. Uh, I have a bunch of noise outside, excuse me for a minute. Sorry about that. Um, so here is the pre-lecture assignment for Wednesday. You click here, you'll watch a video, and then you'll answer some questions, all right? And that's a pre-lecture assignment. Again, that goes in the grade book, depending on how you're doing it. And you can see over here that a few students have already done that, all right? So that's how uh, you do the assignments in mastering. Uh, let me just show you the problem set real quick. Problem set is right here, and you can see that this is more involved, right? Look at, these are all the exercises you have to do, all right? And you just click on these and work through the exercise. Um, there are hints in the exercise, you can use the hints. You have multiple attempts to try the problem, so if you get it wrong the first time, you lose a little bit of credit, but then the second time, um, you can uh, get that, get credit for it, or the third time, et cetera, all right? 
Uh, let's see. I have one question. Go ahead. Danielle. Hi. Um, I was Danielle. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering for the first graded assignment we have, does that include the chapter reading or if not, where do we find that? No, it's not. It doesn't include the chapter reading. You just watch the video and you answer questions based on the video. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so I completed the first, the um, pre-lab lecture that we just did. Yeah. That you just showed. And um, it said that you get multiple attempts to get the right answer. Yeah. And I accident, like I got like the first one wrong and I thought it like I'd still get full credit since I got like it right the second time. Yeah. But it didn't give me full credit said that I got like a 63%. Right, you lose a little bit of credit for each wrong answer, all right? So you get multiple attempts, but every time you put in a wrong answer, you lose a little bit of credit. So you don't wanna just guess. Okay. Okay, okay. good question, thank you. Okay, let's go back. Um, All right, so that's my lab and mastering. I'm gonna go back home here. Again, this home page is really where you always wanna start. A lot of the information is right there. Again, from your point of view, it's gonna look like this. Come on. Uh, all right, what else? Uh, assignments, oh, one, uh, the other thing I wanna show you here on the home page, the other thing you can do here is from here, you could access the mastering assignments as well. So you have an option. You can either access them through the My Lab and Mastering tab, or you can access them here, okay? Uh, the choice is yours, all right? Um, I don't know, most of you probably got, you should have gotten several emails from me by now. Um, I will be sending out an email every week kind of telling you the things you have to do that week. You should have gotten one of those from me this morning. It's via your Pipeline account, so make sure you're checking that, okay? All right, what else? Quizzes, so labs and exams will be here when they come up, all right? Um, discussions, there is a discussion board here. It's not necessarily monitored, but if you wanna post, answer questions to classmates or anything like that, you can have a general discussion here, all right? And that's it, grades is where you can check your grade and, um, and hopefully you all know about that, okay? All right. Any questions on any of that? Awesome. All right. Actually, I have a question. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. So we can either purchase the access code or we could, like from the bookstore, or we can go to the Pearson website and purchase it, but both of them. Don't go to the Pearson website. Go right through Canvas. So go oh, right okay. into Canvas, just like I just did on the student view, right? And it'll have you create an account and then purchase access through Canvas. Do not go to Pearson. Okay, and then that will work for two semesters? If you buy, you have, you have two options. You can buy the one semester, which I think is 80 bucks maybe. And the two semester one, I think is 124. Okay. So it's a little cheaper if you know you're gonna take it next, next winter to t do the two semester one. All classes um, now at SBCC are using the same program, the same book, so. It'll work for any other class as well. It, if you buy the two semester one, would they send you two two packets, one for this semester and one for next? No, semester? you'll just have you'll just have your account and you'll have access for both for both semesters. Okay. All right. So uh, what else? Okay, a few study tips for you. Again. Um, I am completely on your side. I want you to learn. Right. And so I'm going to I'm gonna tell you why I do everything I do. Um, so first of all, you'll notice a lot of assignments. You're basically gonna have about five assignments a week in this class, right? One before lecture, one after lecture for, every, for each of the lectures, and then a big problem set due on Friday. That's five assignments every week. Why do I do that to you? First of all, because um, there's been a lot of research done on how we learn, okay? And one, uh, one way we learn, uh, one of the results of this research is something called the spacing effect. What is the spacing effect? The spacing effect says this, look, if you're trying to learn a subject, what's better? A one three hour block of time that you spend studying for three hours or 
three one hour blocks spaced out over a couple days. Guess what's better? Three one hour blocks spaced out over a couple days. Why is that? You take an information, your brain processes it, puts it in place, and then you, get a, then you have a break and that cements it in your brain. Then the next day you come back to it and you're ready to learn even more, right? And so this has been very well documented. So that's why I wanna keep you learning all week long, right? I want you to learn a little bit before you come to class. Let that process fit into your brain. Then you come to class and we'll reinforce that, right? And then after class, you have another opportunity to really put what you learn in class in action and apply it to something, right? That's why I have pre and post class assignments, right? So that's the spacing effect. Really, really important and, some, and one of the reasons why I assign things the way I do. Secondly, the retrieval effect. I have students coming to me every semester and saying, Dr. Tro, I studied for 10 hours and I failed the exam. And so I asked them, well, how did you study? And they said, well, I reread the notes that I took from class and I reread the book. And then I said, okay, but did you do anything? Did you retrieve information? Did you apply it? Were you active in the process? And it turns out most of the time they weren't. So just rereading and reviewing is not enough. You actually have to be active. Research shows that you learn things when you retrieve it. For example, if you're trying to list a, memorize a list of 10 names, if you just review the list over and over, you're not gonna learn it. But if you cover up the list and try to retrieve those names, that's when learning occurs, right? So that's why I'm gonna constantly ask you questions. The pre-lecture videos have questions embedded in them. They have questions at the end. Why are these questions there? I'm forcing you to retrieve what you're learning and that will cement it in your brain. It actually builds the neural pathways that keep that information stored. During class, I'm gonna ask you questions. I'm gonna pop up a question and put up a poll and I'm gonna have you answer the question. Why? Again, I'm trying to get you to retrieve what you just learned. Build up those neural pathways, right? So that's the retrieval effect, and that's why I'm constantly asking you questions, all right? Third, uh, the effect of pretesting. Every single test will have associated with it a pretest. Studies have shown that if you give a student a pretest, they do better on the actual exam, right? So those pretests are an important form of learning for you, right? And they will help you do better on the exam, and they also count for part of your uh, course, of course, uh, part of your grade, all right? So that's my, um, that's my strategy. That's the reason I'm doing the things that I'm doing. It's gonna feel like a lot of work, especially at first, but you'll get in the habit of it. And I think in the end of the day, you'll be happy you did it because you will be learning. And that's my primary goal for you. Okay, um, grades, uh, I think I went through this already, but just really quick, I will drop some things at the end of the semester. So I will drop one of the problem sets. So let's say one week, you just can't get the problem set done. No problem, you get to drop one. The online, um, sorry, this should be the before and after stuff right here. Uh, I'll drop four of those. So let's say one day, you know, you forget to watch the pre-lecture pre assignment, that's fine, you get to drop four of those, okay? Nothing else really has dropped, um, so everything else will be required, okay? Um, all right, mastering chemistry. I see I, I have a few questions on mastering chemistry. Um, you should not need a course ID for mastering chemistry. If you access it through Canvas, you will not need a course ID. So don't ask me for a course ID, that's not gonna help you. You need to access it through Canvas and then you won't need a course ID. Uh, you will need to have mastering chemistry by Wednesday because that's when things will start counting for credit. Okay, so here's an example of a question. Let's see if I can make this work. Paul. All right, so here, I'm gonna ask these questions throughout the semester and you're gonna answer them. So here's your first one. Go ahead and answer that one for me. Okay, now usually the questions will be a little more involved in this. Uh, sometimes they'll require a calculation. So I expect you to come to class with a pen and paper, and I expect you to also bring a calculator, right? So you're ready to work. Um, again, this is gonna be an active classroom. You're gonna be doing things, again, why? Because 
I want you to learn. All right, the correct answer to that one was B. And uh, let's see, 80% of you got that one. So nice work. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, so I want to close that. All right, thank you. All right, so, so those are the details of the course. I think most of it, hopefully, is going to go smoothly. Un undoubtedly, there'll be some hiccups here and there because of the new format, but I will work with you on those hiccups. And, uh, and we will get through it. So I'm gonna start uh, talking a little bit about chemistry because uh, that's why we're here. But I'm gonna stop for one second to see if there's any other questions. Again, if you have a question, just use the raise hand function on Zoom and I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay, no questions. So that must be pretty clear then. If there are any other questions, you can always email me as well, and I'm happy to answer them. Or you can stick around after class, because I will be here uh, for another hour after class answering your questions. Okay, so let's get on to chemistry, which is the reason we're all here. Um, you know, a lot of people, when you ask them, you know, what is chemistry or what is exciting about chemistry, a lot of people say things like the applications of chemistry, right? Oh, chemists can make a better shampoo or a better hairspray or whatever, right? Or a better adhesive. And, of course, those are all... Um, advantages of, of chemistry and things we enjoy, the chromatic chemistry. But ultimately, I'm a chemist not because of that. Ultimately, I'm a chemist because of chemistry's central ideas, which are these two ideas right here on the screen. First of all, matter is particulate. It's made of particles, right? Now, that doesn't seem particularly obvious, right? If you look at a piece of matter, like the stapler, let's say, for example, right? It seems pretty solid. It's, it's not clear necessarily just from looking at the stapler that this is made of tiny particles too small to see, right? And in fact, for many, many millennia, right, people didn't know that, right? It was really only in the last hundred years, right, or so, that that was sort of proven and shown to be the case, right? That matter is particulate, it's made of particles. There was a long argument about this for 2,000 years from the time of the Greeks, and the Greeks pretty much thought matter wasn't made of particles, that it was continuous, right? But ultimately, matter is made of particles. If you were to take a little piece of this plastic and divide it over and over again, you'd eventually get down to the very smallest pieces of matter, which are atoms, okay? Um, so that's one of the most exciting things that we've discovered uh, in, in chemistry, and that's the core of what chemistry is about. Matter is particulate, number one. Number two, even more amazing, the structure of those particles determines the properties of matter. So the properties of everything you see around you is determined by the structure of these tiny particles that are too small to see. Um, how many particles, uh, how small are these particles? Let me just give you an idea. Um, how many of you ever get down to East Beach or Ledbetter Beach? Hopefully you're all students at City College, so I hope you get down there uh, fairly regularly, right? But just think of the beach, just think of Ledbetter Beach and think of all the sand particles on there, right? Think of all those little particles of sand. Now imagine picking one of those particles up and putting it on your fingertip. It's really hard to pick up just one. You'll probably have dozens of them there, but imagine just one of those. And then ask yourself this question. Are there more particles in that grain of sand or are there more grains of sand on all of Ledbetter Beach? What do you think? Turns out there are more particles on that grain of sand than there are on all of Ledbetter Beach, right? So that's how small these particles are. All right, just to give you an idea, all right? And secondly, the structure of those particles determines the properties of matter. What do I mean by that? Here's water, right? Water is a molecule, it's made up of three atoms, it has this shape, right? Everything about that molecule, or this, everything about that molecule determines the properties of water, right? What would water be like if water, if the structure of water molecules was different? Let's suppose water was linear instead of bent like that. Would liquid water be any different? Yes, it'd be way different. In fact, just changing this angle from bent like this to straight would dramatically change water. It would be a substance unrecognizable as normal water. In fact, it would lower the uh, interactions between water molecules so that water may not even be a liquid at room temperature. Right? So if you change the angle, instead of being a liquid, 
it may be a gas at room temperature. Imagine the implications of that. No oceans, no lakes, no liquid water on the surface of the earth. No us, really, because we have a lot, quite a bit of water in our bodies, right? Um, all from changing the angle of just changing the angle of the water molecule, not even changing the atoms, right? That's how sensitive the, the, the macroscopic world that we can see is to this tiny world, which is, again, unmanageably small, but hugely important, right? And that's why I'm a chemist. I love that we've been able to figure that out. I love that we've been able to figure out, oh my gosh, the properties of this liquid that we take for granted and see around us all the time depend on the structure of these tiny particles that are too small to see and that we've been able to figure out actually exists, right? It's really, really amazing that we've been able to achieve that. And, uh, and the power of that idea, the power of these two ideas together have changed the world, right? Even everything that's going on today with the research in the vaccines and molecules in COVID, right, are due to this, right? They're all due to this. And the, and the, the application of this to biology starting about 50 years ago transformed biology into a completely different discipline and the discipline we see today that can actually control things at the molecular level. So hugely exciting, hugely important, and it's what we're going to be studying all semester long. Uh, I'll give you a couple other examples. Here's water, again, which we know and love. Here's hydrogen peroxide. The only difference is an extra oxygen molecule, an extra oxygen atom. What's the effect of that? Huge effect, right? You put this on your hair, uh, your hair will get wet. You put this on your hair, it bleaches it, right? If you've ever bleached your hair using hydrogen peroxide, actually, and that's not even true. If you put this in your, in your hair on its pure form, it would dissolve your hair and probably burn your scalp. What you use for bleaching your hair is a, is a very dilute solution of hydrogen peroxide, right? But again, the differences at the, at the molecular level have huge effects at the macroscopic level. You already saw in the video that I hope all of you watched before coming to class today, the difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, right? Again, small differences at the molecular level, important differences at the macroscopic level. This gas is toxic, this gas is not. Uh, in chemistry, we have this phenomenon called isomers. Isomers are molecules that have the same atoms, the same exact atoms, but different structures, all right? So it turns out that you could put atoms together differently and have different structures, and you have different materials as a result. You have different compounds as a result. So for example, just to show you, this is the molecule C20H42, okay? It consists of 20 carbon atoms, which you can see here and 42 hydrogen atoms, all right? This is one way to put those atoms together. In fact, there are 366,000 different ways to put them together. So there are 366,000 different compounds that have this same formula. And they all have different properties, different boiling points and everything else, right? So how the structure of those atoms is, is hugely important. And again, that's what we wanna to try to understand. Okay, one more example just to bring this home. Here's uh, graphite and diamond. Graphite and diamond are both made of exactly the same thing, carbon atoms, all right? In one case, the carbon atoms are bonded in sheets like this, all right? That's graphite, and those sheets can slide past each other, but they're not bonded in this direction, right? Which is why when you write with a pencil, these sheets slide off each other and leave uh, a mark on the paper. Right, and we and you all are familiar with the properties of graphite because it's the it's the lead that's in your mechanical pencil. Right, here's diamond, same exact atoms, different structure, completely different substance. Right, so nature can take the same exact atoms, put them together in different ways with different structures, and you get vastly different compounds. Right, diamond is super hard. If you scratch it on paper, it doesn't leave anything. In fact, it will probably tear the paper, and so on. Okay. All right, so why are you here? Why are you learning chemistry? Well, you probably have to take this class as some requirement for your major. Um, and, and so I, uh, that's the case. And I know a lot of you here are for that reason. But I hope throughout this course, you'll have some other reasons for being here. Uh, so for example, one reason I hope that you'll learn about being here is simply to enrich your life. Uh, believe it or not, I think understanding chemistry can enrich your life because it gives you a better understanding of the world around you. Um, 
There was an astronomer uh, that lived about 100 years ago named Sir Arthur Eddington. And Sir Arthur Eddington also figured out how stars burn through fusion. People didn't understand how stars can burn for so long. And, and Eddington figured that out, that it was through nuclear fusion. And so one night he was out with his friends looking at the stars. And one of his friends said, look, Arthur, look how beautifully the stars burn. And the day before, Eddington had just figured out how stars burn for millions and billions of years through nuclear fusion. And he turned to his friend and he said, yeah, they burn beautifully, but I know how they burn right? I know how they burn. Eddington knew what was going on in that star to make that light that he could view, right? And that made the experience of seeing the stars even more amazing than it would have been without that knowledge. So chemistry is the same way, right? You're going to learn a lot this semester about the world that's all around you, right? Even a glass of water made up of water molecules and all the interactions that are going there. And I hope you can look at the world in a new way, right? And you can understand what's going on beneath the surface to produce the world uh, that we all experience. And that will enrich your life and make you a deeper and richer person, just like Eddington. The second reason um, I think you should learn chemistry is because we live in a scientific age. And we have a lot of scientific misinformation around us. And this coronavirus situation has only exacerbated that social media and the lack of authority in terms of voices that we hear just exacerbates the situation. And there's so much out there that's just bullshit, right? It's just BS. And science is a way to tell the difference between BS and what actually has some merit, right? And so that's another reason you should learn chemistry is so you can be a responsible citizen, right? So you can understand the scientific issues of our day, and so you can make intelligent choices about what you do, who you vote for, how you spend your time, what you spend your money on, right? If our whole society understood all of this better, I believe we'd have a much better society. So those are the two reasons I think uh, that you really can benefit from this course, besides the fact that you have to take it as a requirement for your major. All right, let's see. Uh, Diana, you have a question? Diana Kling? Uh, no, I don't have a question. Yeah. Did you have your hand raised? No, no, I was. Um, oh, okay. For some reason, your, your hand is raised. That's fine. I'll lower your hand. No worries. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Use the hand raise if you do. All right, I love this uh, quote by Albert Einstein, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible, right? We can understand the world around us and we can even understand these tiny particles that are too small to see and too small to even imagine their size, right? So we're gonna jump into this. Uh, we're gonna start looking at how uh, science approaches knowledge. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about matter and then changes in matter and then we'll look at energy, okay? So that's what I hope to cover here uh, in, the in the next uh, 35 minutes or so uh, that we have left. So first, the scientific approach to knowledge. So let's start. Uh, we want to understand uh, the scientific approach a little bit because chemistry is, after all, uh, a science. And let's see. I want to make this just a little bit smaller. So you can see my whole screen here. All right, so um, the scientific approach often begins with observations. All right, uh, what's an observation? Well, it could be really simple. So for example, uh, Antoine Lavoisier, who is the father of modern chemistry, made observations on burning things, right? He liked to burn things. And he would weigh the stuff before he burned it and then after he burned it. And he burned it in closed containers uh, so that nothing could escape, right? He made a controlled observation on matter. So it could be as simple as that. It could be much more complicated. It could involve huge, complicated atom smashers, right? 
and these atom smashers then smash atoms together and they send out particles and you have all these detectors that detect all these particles. So it could be hugely complicated, require hundreds of people and a lot of instrumentation, or it could be really simple. You burn something, you see what happens, right? So that's an observation. You're observing something about, um, uh, uh, about the world. A number of observations can lead to a law. A law or scientific law is a simple statement that summarizes a large number of observations. Okay, a simple statement that summarizes a large number of observations. So for example, Antoine Lavoisier burned a lot of different substances and he weighed them before burning and after burning in a closed container. And one thing he noticed is if you burn things in a closed container, the mass never changed, right? So out of all those observations, he made a law. What was the law? It's called the law of conservation of mass. And we'll talk about it more later, but the law of conservation of mass basically says in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed, all right? So that's an example of a law. A law is just a, a simple statement that summarizes a large number of observations, all right? Uh, observations and laws could also lead to something called a hypothesis. And you've probably heard this term before. Uh, it's not my favorite uh, scientific term, but it's basically a guess at the underlying reasons behind a guess at the underlying reasons behind laws and observations, okay? Um, um, a theory or uh, over, over, over here on, uh, oh yeah, I, I see, is this? Ah, see, I can use this laser pointer. Okay, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me go back. Um, a theory, uh, which can also be called a model, is, um, and I'm going to use that same word to define it, unfortunately, but a model for the way nature is. And these two are very closely related. Okay, a hypothesis and a theory are very closely related. So let me just give you an example. So again, Anton Lavoisier made observations. What did he do? He weighed matter before and after burning it. Then he came up with a law. What was the law? In a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. All right? Then other scientists came up with a model for nature based on those theories and observations. What was the model? The model is the atomic theory. The idea that matter is particular came out of those observations. So the atomic theory is an example of the, uh, sorry, the idea that matter is ultimately made of atoms is a theory, right? It's a model for the way nature is, yeah? And it tells you the underlying reasons behind laws and observations. So at first, um, a, mo a theory is just a hypothesis, right? But over time, hypotheses can kind of graduate into theories as they're refined, and especially as they're tested by experiment, right? So an experiment is a controlled observation designed to test a hypothesis or theory, right? And uh, when you have enough experiments, then a hypothesis can graduate into a theory, all right? Now, here's a, here's a problem. In our common language, we use theory to mean something that isn't true or isn't proven or kind of in a way, oh, that's just a theory. That's not the way theory is, is used in science, okay? In science, a theory is sort of the highest form of scientific knowledge right? It's a model for the way nature is that has been shown to be very likely to be true through many, many, many observations and experiments, 
right? So theory is as good as it gets in science. That's what we know. So what are some examples of theories? The atomic theory, the idea that the matter is made of atoms. Um, the, um, uh, the, the model of our universe and our solar system with the sun is in the middle. That's a model for how our universe is, right? Uh, we're going to look at a lot of theories uh, throughout this semester. We're going to look at theories for chemical bonding, for example. We're going to look at theories for the behavior of gases, right? And as we examine these, keep in mind this. Really, throughout this semester, many, many times, all I'm, we're going to do is I'm going to show you some observations on matter. I'm going to show you some laws that came out of those observations. And then we're going to discuss and learn about theory. Right? So keep those pieces of the scientific approach to knowledge in your mind because we'll be revisiting them often. Okay? All right. Let's see. Any questions? No questions? All right. Good. Uh, all right, here's a question for you. Let's see if we can make this one work. Uh, uh, hold on, let me get rid of this one. For some reason, this one's still up. All right. All right, here we go. Here's the new question. Go ahead and answer that one. Uh, and I see I have a little bit of a, mm -mm. sorry, I don't want to correct, I noticed I had a typo on that slide. Uh, a theory describes what nature, is is what I meant to say. Okay, ten more seconds. So I'm going to end this. All right, and and let me see. Share I'm going to share the results. Can you guys see that? Can you guys see my results? Awesome. So um, most of you got the right answer, which is B. A law summarizes a series of related observations, right? If we look over here, can you still see it? You still see the results? Yeah. Okay. Um, a law, a, a, a law summarizes a large number of observations, but remember, a theory gives the underlying reasons behind it, right? So B is the right answer. I noticed a few of you put C, right? A theory describes what nature is. A law describes why nature does it. That's not correct, right? Because a law doesn't describe why. A law simply summarizes observations, right? The law of conservation of mass. A law says, in a chemical reaction, chemicals neither create nor destroy. A, a law just says what nature does. It doesn't give us the why, all right? A theory gives us the why, right? So the idea that, that, that matter is all made, made of atoms is the atomic theory. It's a model for how nature really is, right? And it explains the law of conservation of mass because if, if, if matter is ultimately made of atoms, then the chemical reaction, they regroup, but they don't get destroyed, right? So that's the idea. All right. Very good. All right, let's go on. So B was the correct answer there. All right, classification of matter. You watched a video on this. There will be things that I'm going to talk about in lecture of which you already watched a video before lecture and the pre-lecture. So those topics I'm going to go through just very, very quickly 
because you have already have watched the video on it. That's why it's very important that you always watch the pre-lecture videos before the video, before the lecture, sorry. Otherwise, uh, you're gonna be lost, right? So make sure you're watching those, those um, pre-lecture videos. In this case, it was the one that um, I sent out on the email that you just clicked on, all right? So the classification of matter, we can classify matter, as the video said, by state or by composition. If you classify them by state, you could have solid, liquid, or gas, right? We're familiar with all of those. Ice, water, and water vapor, for example. Uh, the reason these substances are different, right, is because look at the structure of the particles that compose them, right? They're arranged differently, right? In a solid, they're all very close and touching and organized into a nice crystalline lattice. In liquid, that structure breaks down. They're still touching and very close to each other, but they're no longer in that crystalline lattice. And in the gas, they've broken free of each other and are bouncing off the walls of the container kind of like this, okay? A solid has a fixed shape and a fixed volume, right? You can't change the volume or the shape of a solid unless you really put a lot of pressure on it. A liquid assumes the shape of its container, uh, but it has a, still has a fixed volume just like a solid, but it does not have a fixed shape. And then of course a gas has neither of those. Um, a solid is not compressible. If you try to compress, this would be an example of dry ice. If you try to push down the solid really hard, you can't really compress it very much. A gas, on the other hand, is compressible. If you push down on it, you can compress it. And again, I'm summarizing here and going quickly because you already watched a video on this. So that's one way of classifying matter. Another way, oh, I forgot one thing. I forgot to define matter for you. So uh, let me do that real quick. Matter, uh, anything that occupies space and has mass, okay? So matter is anything that has space uh, and, has, and has mass, Occupy space and has mass. Uh, so for example, right, the stapler is made of matter, right? We're made of matter, yeah? Um, how about light? Is light matter? You can shake your head yes or no. Light is not matter, right? Because it has no mass, okay? So light is not, is an example of something that's not matter, all right? Uh, what about the air around us? Do you think the air around us is matter? Yeah, it is. The air around us is matter. It has space, it, it occupies space and it has mass, okay? And you can feel, if you just go like this, Right? You can feel the particles in air, right? Against your hand. What you feel against your hand are the particles in air, right? The mass that's in the air. Um, if you were to do that in outer space, you wouldn't feel anything because there wouldn't be any matter there. Okay. All right. And the other way we can classify matter is by its composition. And again, hopefully you went through this on the, on the video. So matter can either have variable composition from one sample to another, in which case it's a mixture or it can have a composition that's always the same no matter what the sample of matter, in which case it's the pure substance, right? Pure substances themselves can be either elements or compounds, right? So the helium in the balloon or the helium in the Goodyear blimp is a good example of a pure substance, right? It's helium. It's an element, right? It's made up of helium atoms. Water is a good example of a compound, right? I can't separate out water and get two different substances, right? Um, it's, it's a pure substance, but I can break the bonds and get hydrogen and oxygen. So that's what makes this a compound. Can't do that for helium. A mixture can be, uh, is two or more substances in uh, proportions that can be varied, right? Mixtures can be homogeneous, in which case they are uh, the same throughout, right? So a cup of tea is a good example of a homogeneous mixture. This part of the tea or that part of the tea would have the same composition. Sand and water would be an example of a heterogeneous mixture, right? So some parts of it will be pure sand, some parts of it will be water, and depending on where you take a sample, you'll get a, you might get a different substance, okay? Again, I'm going through this quickly. If you didn't watch the video before class, please make sure you go back and you watch it after class so you get all these details. All right, uh, here's another question for the poll. Let's try this. 
Uh, and go ahead, answer this question. Okay, five more seconds. Okay, so most of you put A, and A is in fact the right answer. Um, this is a pure substance, why? Because notice all the particles that make it up are one type of particle, right? What kind of a pure substance do you think this is? Is it an element or a compound? It's a compound, right? It's a compound because it's made of two different atoms, right? So it's a compound. Um, let's see, some of you put D, none of the above. This is a pure substance because it's a compound. Let me see, let's go back uh, to this. So, um, so you got a pure substance, compound. So the, the image that you saw is kind of like water, right? Water has two different atoms that make, two different types of atoms that make it up, but it's still a pure substance. Why? Because all the particles are the same. Notice this is water, this is water, this is water, right? Notice that in mixtures, you have different kinds of particles, different kinds of molecules making it up, all right? So that's the difference uh, between a, um, so, so, so this is a pure substance. What is this? This is a mixture. What kind of mixture? Homogeneous. Yep. Homogeneous mixture, right? Because it's all mixed in together, right? What about this? This is also a mixture, but what kind of mixture is this? Heterogeneous. Yep, absolutely right. Very good. Okay, let's continue. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about physical and chemical changes and physical and chemical properties, all right? So um, a physical change is a change in the appearance of matter uh, by the way can you guys read this perfect but not its composition right a change in the appearance of matter but not its composition so for example boiling is a physical change. Notice liquid water is H2O molecules. Steam is H2O molecules. When you boil it, you change its appearance, you change its state, right? But the composition is still the same. It's still water, all right? Uh, that's in contrast to a chemical change. All right, a chemical change um, is, is a change in appearance and composition, okay? So it's change in composition. Actually, and sometimes the appearance doesn't always necessarily change, but so I'm gonna define it as a change in the composition of matter. All right, so for example, when iron rusts, right? You initially have iron atoms, which looks something like this. They combine with oxygen, and now you form a whole new substance. Notice the composition has changed. You have a different substance after you rust, okay? So that's a chemical change. Associated with physical change are physical properties. Physical properties are properties that matter can display without changing its composition.
okay? A, a, chemical chain, uh, a chemical property, on the other hand, can only be displayed by a change in composition. So, for example, the boiling point of water, is that a physical property or chemical property? When I ask questions like this, if a couple of you want to unmute and answer them, that would be great. Is, is the boiling of water a chemical, a physical, sorry, the boiling point of water a physical property or chemical property? Physical. Physical, yeah, right, because it can display it without changing its composition. The flammability of gasoline. Is that a chemical property or a physical property? Chemical. Chemical. Chemical property, absolutely right. Okay, so um, very, very good. Here's uh, burning propane. Chemical change or physical change? Chemical. Chemical change, very good. Dry, the sublimation of dry ice. You've all seen dry ice before, it's made of carbon dioxide. When it sublimes, is that a chemical change or physical change? Physical. Physical. physical, physical, right? Notice CO2, still have CO2, so that's physical. All right, very good. All right, let's have a quick question here. All right, go ahead and answer this question. Okay, five more seconds. Very good. The correct answer is A, right? And uh, let's see what, 73% of you got A, so very, very good, that's correct. A few of you put C. Notice that when water, since, since the boiling of water is a physical change, right? then the composition must remain the same. So the water molecules are the same in the gas as they were in the liquid, because that's a physical change, right? If this, was the, if this was the result of boiling, that would be a chemical change, right? You'd have to break apart the water molecules. By the way, water boils at 100 degrees. Why? Because um, that's the amount of thermal energy you need to overcome the interactions between water molecules, all right, and get them to boil. Doing this to water would require much, much more energy, right? You'd have to heat up water to thousands of degrees to break chemical bonds because chemical bonds are much stronger than these interactions between the water molecules, okay? Um, so again, the right answer here is A because that's a physical change and um, water molecules don't break up. Okay, very good. Let's continue. Uh, little bit about energy. So we've talked uh, so far about matter, right? And by the way, a lot of what you see around you is matter, right? As you're looking around yourself right now, you know, you're surrounded by matter and even you're even made of matter, right? Um, our universe is basically made of three things. Matter, which we just talked about. Space, which is space that's around you. There's no empty space really here, but in other parts of the universe, of course, there's a lot of empty space. Um, the space in, the, in your room you're in is filled with air, right? Um, and then energy. Energy is the third component. And uh, a lot of chemical and physical change has energy changes associated with it. So I want to talk a little bit about energy, okay? Uh, let's see. So let's start with a few definitions, okay? So first of all, uh, what is energy? 
Uh, energy is um, the capacity to do work. Well, what's work? Work is the result of a force acting on a distance. Okay, so when you push a box across the floor, for example, right? You have a force, the push acting on a distance. So you've exerted some energy, right? So there's this, this person here has energy uh, in the, that comes from the food they ate, right? They can get energy from that food and then they can exert that energy uh, by a force acting on a distance, all right? Um, there are different uh, kinds of energy. So let me talk about those for a minute. Uh, kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of an object. Login. It says invalid email slash password combination, but I just created the account. Uh, let's see. Someone. And I've doubled, I've checked like five times. There we go. Um, Would it be possible that you could zoom out on the paper a little bit? It's. Oh, actually, never mind. I, I had my, um, camera over that. Never mind. Okay. Great. Great, 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 great. Thanks. If I zoom out, the writing is going to get too small, I'm afraid. Um, all right, so you got energy, capacity to do work, work, force action at a distance, kinetic energy, energy associated with the motion of an object, right? You may know this equation if you've had physics. Uh, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, right? So the kinetic energy of something is one half its mass times its velocity squared, all right? So, right, if I throw a pen across the room, as the pen moves, it has kinetic energy due to its motion, okay? Um, other kinds of energy, we can have potential energy. And that's the energy associated with the position or composition of an object. So uh, usually when I say the position here, I mean the position within some sort of field, like a gravitational field or a magnetic field, right? So um, for example, let me just put myself on screen here for a minute. Um, for example, if, you, if I lift something up, right? If I lift the stapler up off the desk, right? It has potential energy because of its position in the gravitational field, right? If I drop it, right, it, that potential energy comes out as what kind of energy? Kinetic energy, right? It falls to the desk, and then that energy turns into thermal energy of the desk, right? Um, so that uh, is an example of um, potential energy. Let me get back to my screen here. This always takes a little bit of time. Okay, uh, so... Potential energy. Um, what else? I want to talk about uh, thermal energy. Is the energy associated with the temperature of an object? Right? So when um, so things can have thermal energy, for example, something that's warm has more thermal energy than something that's cold, right? If you heat up uh, a piece of metal, it's going to have thermal energy uh, because it's, it's hotter than when it was cold, right? So that's an example of thermal energy. Thermal energy really is a kind of potential energy, right? Sorry, not potential energy. Thermal energy is really a kind of kinetic energy, right? Because what's, what's the motion associated with thermal energy? The motion of what? Heat. Uh, the motion of, uh, sometimes it's called heat, but it's the motion of what, what's moving when you get something warm, when you heat it up. What well, moves faster? Well, the molecules, exactly right, exactly right. So thermal energy, right, 
is really a kind of kinetic energy, okay? And then lastly, I wanted to find chemical energy. Chemical energy is energy associated with the positions of electrons and protons in matter, right? So um, it's a kind of potential energy, right? Energy associated, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it this way, associated uh, with the position of charged particles in matter, okay? And, uh, and we'll talk more about what those charged particles are, all right? But here's another example. Here's a weight on top of a building, right? It has a lot of potential energy. Why? Because of its position in the gravitational field, right? When it falls, that potential energy turns into kinetic energy, falls, hits the ground, that kinetic energy gets transferred into thermal energy, all right? Notice that energy is not created nor destroyed, and that's called the law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, all right? The law of conservation of energy. Um, some chemical systems, like gasoline, for example, have what we call chemical potential energy. The gasoline in a car is a little bit like this raised weight, okay? The molecules have this potential energy due to the positions of the charged particles within them. And they can undergo a chemical reaction, right, which rearranges those charged particles. And some of that potential energy is then released, right? It's released. Uh, let's see. Oops. Yikes. What did I just do? It's not what I wanted. Excuse me for a second. Okay. Uh, that energy is released. Uh, it turns into kinetic energy. And then... When it hits the ground, it's transferred to thermal energy. So the energy is never destroyed, right? It's just transferred from one form to another. So from potential energy to kinetic energy to thermal energy, okay? And we're gonna be following energy and talking about energy throughout this class. So one thing to understand about energy is that it's neither created nor destroyed. Another thing to underst understand about energy is that systems often go from high potential energy to low potential energy. That's often the case. Like for example, this raised weight, right? When it falls, it goes from high potential energy to low potential energy. In a chemical reaction, the, part of the, the molecules often go from high potential energy in gasoline to low potential energy in the exhaust, okay? Um, so we'll be talking about that a lot. The other thing to understand about energy and probably the most important thing about energy that we'll be talking about again throughout the semester is called the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that energy is dispersed, not concentrated, right? So if you have a hot cup of coffee, what happens to that thermal energy? Does it suck more thermal energy from the room around it and get hotter and hotter? Or does the thermal energy from the cup of coffee disperse into the room? Which one is it? It dissipates into the room. Exactly. So energy doesn't concentrate itself, it disperses itself. And that turns out to be very, very important in a lot of what we're gonna be talking about. So we'll keep that in mind as well. Okay, I see our time is up. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, our next topic for next uh, Wednesday, we'll start looking at the units of measurement and significant figures. There's a couple of videos uh, to watch for that. There are your pre that's your pre-lecture assignment that'll be due Wednesday at two o'clock, all right? Thank you all uh, for your attention and for your participation. I appreciate it. And uh, feel free to stick around if you have questions. Otherwise, I'll see you all on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.